And uh, I'd like to welcome everybody now formally to this session. Uh, my name is Lee Godden. I'm the Director of the Centre for Resources, Energy and Environmental Law at uh, the University of Melbourne in Australia. I've had a very long interest in various aspects of biodiversity protection, but recently uh, very much come to think about the importance of enforcement, implementation and compliance. And um, I co-wrote an environmental law textbook a couple of years ago, and it fell to me to write um, the chapter that covered those topics. And um, so it's with great pleasure that I welcome um, the panel presenting today on this very important topic. And dare I say, it's often an overlooked topic, but that does not diminish its central importance. And um, we will go with the order of presenters as listed uh, on the program. And we'll allow 10 minutes each person and uh, brief questions, or you can address them to uh, the chat function. And then we'll end up with um, more substantial questions and a dialogue of our own to fit in with this wonderful global dialogue that's been presented across um, the, the conference uh, to date. So one last thing I'd like to do, and uh, that is to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and waters on which I'm situated. I've done a lot of work with Indigenous peoples over some 25 years or so, and they have their own indicia for enforcement and compliance in connection to country. So um, it, it adds a different cultural dimension. And so it's wonderful to see so many different countries and nations and perspectives for this panel. So if I could start with uh, Rika, please, uh, uh, if you'd like to move to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee. Um, I will share my presentation. Hope it's showing just fine. Uh, at the moment, it's yeah, it is fine now. Okay. So a hand across to you. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, for us to present our study on providing remedies for biodiversity through conservation litigation. Uh, with the case of Indonesia. And as you might all have known that Indonesia hosted a lot of threatened and endangered protective species like Sumatran tiger, Bunyan orangutan, and helmeted hornbill, which mean uh, they have, we have uh, the obligation to protect them not only by preventive policy, but also to ensure that uh, whenever harm occur, there will be remedies to fix the harm. And harm to this biodiversity itself in Indonesia could uh, come from two uh, type of cases. The first one is whenever harm occurred to their habitat, such as in the case of forest fire, illegal logging or pollution, and uh, harm that occurred directly to the individual species without uh, significantly damage the habitat, like in the case of illegal wildlife trade. For the harm uh, that targeted the environment at general or harm to the habitat in Indonesia itself, there has been 15 lawsuits on environmental damage filed by our Ministry of Environment, uh, requiring the perpetrator to be responsible for damage that occurred. And from this lawsuit, we can see that biodiversity has been one of the component that always been requested to be uh, compensated here, whether it is in a restoration cost or ecological damage claim. But uh, even though there is still uh, a criticize on how Ministry, Indonesia Ministry of Environment from the harm to biodiversity and how they, they come up with number for the, this harm to biodiversity, but at least for the case which involve harm to the habitat, uh, there has been acknowledgement that the perpetrator need to, to pay or to bear the compensation for biodiversity loss. 
But this is not, unfortunately, this is not always the case for harm that targeted species, uh, specific species, such as in the case of illegal wildlife trade, uh, in which in this opportunity is the topic that uh, I would like to discuss more, the approach to the case like illegal wildlife trade. In Indonesia, we, all of the illegal wildlife trade, we uh, deal with it through criminal law. And I think this is also a general case in uh, many of the country where illegal wildlife trade is uh, punished by criminal law, pursuing high imprisonment and fine, which is good, but actually has not addressed the damage that the environmental damage that happened uh, because of this illegal wildlife trade. Meanwhile, in the case of illegal wildlife trade, we know that there are environmental damage, biodiversity harm that occurred that need to be remedies. For example, when one orangutan is uh, captured in illegal wildlife trade, uh, if it is caught alive, then uh, we need required long-term care, rehabilitation, and reintroduction of the individual species to uh, their habitat. And it also reduces uh, the survivability of the population, especially if the uh, individual is at a productive age. And also it reduces public access to ecosystem goods and services, such as wildlife tourism, scientific and cultural value uh, related to these species, and also undermines public trust in the government's ability to protect the endangered species. Sadly, unlike the case in forest fire, this harm has never been the burden of perpetrator. So it is no wonder that uh, we know uh, illegal wildlife trade is known as uh, high, low risk, high return crime because the, the amount of damage has never been the responsibility of the perpetrator before. And so, in the conclusion, uh, in the current practice in Indonesia regarding these illegal wildlife trade cases, uh, the criminal law respond to the crime, to the illegal action, but not yet to the harm that occur. That's why in this research, we explore uh, the approach of civil liability to provide harm to biodiversity, in which court could order the perpetrator to do some remedial action. And since there has not been many cases on this uh, topic yet and uh, in, in uh, worldwide during our research we only found one cases in French in which the national park uh, sued the uh, uh, poacher to uh, for the to claim the environmental damage because they harvested it, uh, protected species in the national park so uh, we in this research uh, because we could not do the court decision review to see how the judges perceive uh, this uh, biodiversity harm. We use uh, mock trial to explore how the judge think about uh, uh, the biodiversity harm in this type of cases. We provide them a hypothetical case of illegal wildlife trade. And then we uh, give them an online questionnaire after, after they read the case. And after that, we, for, uh, we have a follow-up interview on, uh, to ask the judges on the reason behind the question. In this questionnaire, uh, they will be asked uh, to rank what type of remedy to uh, biodiversity harm in illegal wildlife trade that they think will likely to be accepted by the court. And in the end, we have 32 respondents of judges in this research. And in this hypothetical case, to conceptualize remedies, we use uh, the approach uh, on remedial action rather than uh, coming up with a default value or uh, natural capital valuation of a species, an approach that, uh, that has been used in many other research. In this research, uh, we, we talk to the conservationists. Uh, if one animal is harmed in illegal wildlife trade, what kind of action you think it's needed to remedy the harm? And then uh, after we come up with the action, we then uh, monetize how much money is needed to take the action. Uh, based on our con uh, conversation with the conservationists, we come up with 11 action that could remedy the harm. And then we ask the judges whether they think it is likely to be uh, accepted in the court. 
uh, there are 11 action. For example, the cost of any, uh, animal rehabilitation, long-term animal care, the research, the scientific research to prepare the lawsuit, the cost for transporting and extracting the biological material. And since it also affect the population, then it should be also the remedy uh, that address the harm in population. And all of these actions uh, uh, currently has never been the burden of the perpetrator. We can see the uh, judges' uh, view on this remedy are varied. Uh, for a, a, a concrete uh, cost like animal rehabilitation, it's uh, many judges likely to accept it. But for a more uh, abstract uh, uh, remedy like the conservation education, there has been an hesitation among the judges. And there are several considerations for the judges whether to accept or not to accept this remedy. And we believe it could be also the consideration for a future plaintiff who want to try or exercise this uh, civil liability approach in illegal wildlife trade. The first one is the foundation of the case uh, regarding three main, main issues, which is causation, degree of uncertainty, and ability to conceptualize or quantify harm and the remedy. And also the attribute of the proposed remedy itself. The most important thing uh, we believe here is the feasibility, because when we talk with the scientists and conservationists, they usually come up with a very creative idea of restorative action. But then when we come to the court or judges, there is a, a limitation on rule of law or, or on the institutional uh, arrangement on what can be done. Also, uh, the third consideration is the fairness, proportionality, and defendant ability to pay. This is uh, the case in Indonesia because in many illegal wildlife trade, the one being uh, persecuted is uh, usually the low-level player with uh, commonly uh, poor people. So for this new approach, it is needed to, uh, to be pursued strategically on who should be uh, the defendant and uh, more prevalently, the, uh, we need to target the uh, high level players in the illegal wildlife trade network. And also the fourth one is the, the quality of argumentation, especially here, the judges rely a lot with, uh, for, uh, to the expert witness on how they could ex explain uh, eloquently in the court about what kind of damage that uh, has happened. And the fifth consideration is the legal basis, basis for decision making, which is whether or not the written law has uh, acknowledged this kind of remedy. And if not, could they do some kind of judicial activism to uh, stretch the law and accommodate the remedy? Or could they refer to the precedent jurisprudence? Which, uh, surprisingly, they said uh, they are willing to take a look at uh, other countries practice as a jurisprudence reference. Okay. And also interesting, the last one is interesting uh, consideration is the court border rules in society that the judges uh, also think that uh, how to make a court decision that could educate and uh, give a message to society such as in the case of an illegal wildlife trade that harming even one orangutan could have a multiplying effect yeah. and um, so that is that will Rika, be would you mind uh, just your your final points please thank you yeah so this is this will be my uh, last slide and in general judges agree that uh, by the, there are biodiversity that need to be biodiversity harm that need to be remedied in illegal wildlife trade but there has not been any cases trial yet uh, however, the opinion on what type of remedies are, can be granted is varied and exercising this conservation litigation, we believe it's uh, important to, to help the perpetrator uh, liable for the damage that occur. Thank you so much for the time. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to the dialogue and the, the discussion. Thank you. Um, a wonderful start. And for those people joining us, um, we have just had our first presentation in this session of enhancing enforcement, um, implementation and compliance. And wonderful graphics, wonderful innovative thinking um, in, uh, in display there in that presentation. 
if I could now turn to Hannah, please, uh, to begin your presentation. And uh, I'll hand you across now. Thank you. Maybe if I show a little like that, and you've got one minute to go. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm delighted to be here today speaking about a piece I'm working on, which is called Australia's role in ending global deforestation, moving beyond illegal logging legislation. And really, I am kind of cr cutting across all the themes for this panel. So enforcement, but also in particular issues around implementation and the logistics of implementing this particular piece of legislation, as well as how it impacts compliance, particularly in the forestry industry and in importation of timber products as an industry as well. So in this paper, I suggest amendments to Australia's illegal logging laws, which comprise of the Illegal Logging Act 2012 and also the illegal logging regulations, which came into force in 2018. Um, the po point, um, I also point to areas for further regulation and enhanced engagement that would put Australia at the forefront of efforts to end global deforestation. And this is a project that I'm considering expanding and really looking at Australia's place in a global dialogue around ending deforestation um, and the harmful impacts that that has on biodiversity. Um, so through enactment of existing illegal logging laws, Australia has signaled to the world that it cares about the preservation of forests and ecosystems, as well as the communities and cultures that these forests protect. Um, so now I feel like it's time for Australia to take action to ensure that these laws are fit for purpose. So in the paper, I begin by demonstrating the importance of forests to our social, economic and environmental well-being. I think I might be preaching to the choir here a little bit on that. And we've had some wonderful illustrations of how forests uh, support biodiversity over the last few days. Um, forests sit at the heart of our planet's ability to sustain life, um, covering nearly a third of all land on Earth and 16% of Australia's land. Um, but unfortunately, we are in the midst of a serious deforestation crisis. Um, and this deforestation results in loss of vital ecosystems and biodiversity, as well as increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which accelerates climate change and undermines our planet's resilience. So having established this as an important and kind of central role for forests in securing this vibrant and resilient planet, I move on to summarize the Illegal Logging Act and regulations paying special attention to the challenges and limitations of the current framework, which reflects similar frameworks established in the United States, the United Kingdom and Europe, and also the kind of framework that's being developed in other countries such as China, Korea and Japan. These laws follow a consistent model and represent an important component of efforts to stem deforestation. However, the current laws suffer from three serious limitations. First, they rely on source country definitions of legality. Second, they fail to address the harms that can result from legal deforestation. And finally, they apply only to the production and importation of timber products. Although in the United Kingdom, there is this idea of exploring the expansion of this type of law to apply to all forest risk commodities. So I'll just briefly expand on each of these limitations now, starting with the reliance on source country definitions of legality. In Australia, it is an offence to import timber that is harvested in violation of laws in place in the country where that timber originated from. And importers are required to conduct due diligence to assess whether there's a risk that the timber was harvested illegally. The problem is that it's very difficult to guarantee legality of timber harvested in far-flung jurisdictions where legal frameworks are often complex, law enforcement is weak, and incentives for fraud and corruption are significant. This creates an evaluation challenge for importers and a detection and enforcement challenge for regulators in destination countries such as Australia. The second limitation is linked to the first. Because illegal logging laws focus on source country definitions, they fail to recognize the connection between legally justified logging and harmful deforestation. In some countries where forest industries are a major contributor to the economy, laws are weak or non-existent and may allow for clear felling of natural forests or other ecologically harmful and destructive practices without these practices being illegal. In many cases, this can result in harmful logging, but 
our laws wouldn't recognize that timbers, the harm that has been caused by that timbers importation. Brazil is a really good example of this, particularly with recent deregulation of the forestry industry and that impact. So in this context, Australian companies could be importing timber from Brazil that is the result of clear felling of the Amazon rainforest, a really significant global impact on forestry and ecosystems. But this is not being prevented by the existing law. A more complicated situation exists in places such as Papua New Guinea or the Solomon Islands where I've conducted some research. In these countries, forest laws are often quite robust, um, but they're not always within the forestry industry's regulations. So you might have environmental or constitutional rights being protected, but the forest legislation itself allows for workarounds and loopholes, which make the timber appear legitimate when actually it hasn't been the result of in particular community or traditional landholder consultation as required under the constitution or other source country legislation. So the third limitation and the final one I want to talk about today is the, relate, the scope of the laws and the relationship this has on effectiveness and implementation. So by focusing exclusively on the importation and harvest of timber products, the law fails to acknowledge the interconnections between illegal logging, deforestation, and economic activities that are unrelated to the forestry industry. For example, we know, to use Brazil again, that a large percentage of Amazon deforestation is due to clearing for agriculture including grazing livestock for sale in the United States or growing soy and feed for livestock raised in other countries. In East Asia and the Pacific, deforestation has occurred to make way for oil palm plantations with well-documented devastating impacts on local ecosystems and biodiversity. Orangutans come to mind whenever I think about oil palm. Um, so often the logging that occurs to make way for other industrial activities is illegal and a breach of source country laws. However, due to the nature of the illegal logging laws in Australia and other destination countries, importation of resulting products such as Brazilian soy for cattle feed or farm oil for food products would not be subject to the due diligence requirements in the existing law. To summarize, the current Australian illegal logging legislation suffers from three major limitations, reliance on source country definitions of legality, failure to recognize the harms caused by illegal deforestation and failure to recognize the contribution of other industries to illegal logging and deforestation. The definitional limit makes evaluation by importers and enforcement regulation difficult. This is a topic I've explored elsewhere. The second limitation, the failure to acknowledge harms caused by legal deforestation means that illegal logging is limited in its ability to overcome deforestation and prevent large scale habitat loss and destruction to biodiversity. The third limitation, the constraint on the scope of the law and the focus on forest industry in isolation means that it does not recognize the impact Australia has on forests of the world, not just as a consumer of timber, but also as a provider of finance and as a consumer of other commodities unrelated to the timber industry. I argue that this is a missed opportunity. And in section three of the article, I highlight that Australia has an influential position as a developed consumer economy contributing to deforestation and a unique opportunity to make some changes that could improve the situation. I also argue that Australia has an ethical obligation and a practical opportunity to set a new legal standard for other developed economies to follow, taking the steps necessary to end deforestation and develop a truly sustainable global timber industry and create a more vibrant and resilient planet. I use the UK example because there have recently been movements in this area. Um, I will skip the details of the UK Act with one minute remaining, um, but I conclude in section four by presenting an alternative model for forest regulation, a model that starts with illegal logging, but extends much further into meaningfully addressing deforestation and biodiversity loss. I recommend several amendments, including um, addressing the limited scope of existing laws by recommending that all forest risk commodities be covered in a similar way to the UK. And I also suggest going further with Australia taking the initiative to develop a more holistic global understanding of harmful deforestation that extends beyond just illegal logging. I'd be happy to discuss any of these um, suggestions further in the discussion and dialogue to follow. And I thank you very much for your time.
perfectly timed. Thank you, Hannah. And uh, some wonderful um, points there that I can see cross uh, themes already. The, the notion of harm, how do you deal with uh, harm and biodiversity loss crossing both of those uh, beautiful papers. Uh, without further ado, I think we, uh, unless there's uh, any particular questions that people have for either uh, Rika or Hannah at the moment, uh, are there any clarification questions um, that anyone has? I'm not seeing any hands or there's nothing in the chat. So I think we, we, we might move to our third speaker. And could I ask him to please um, begin his presentation? And uh, thank you. And as I said, what I might do, if that's okay, I'll just go like that where there's one minute to go. So thank you. Thank you, Panel Chair, and uh, thank you for organizing the event. Um, so I, can I use the share screen? Certainly, yes. And I can't claim any of the organization beyond getting myself um, here as chair. That goes to Macquarie and, and the wonderful team that have supported this conference. Thank you, you can, to begin. Okay, thank you. Uh, so my topic is, uh, is corporate mandatory due diligence a cure in supply chains? Uh, I followed uh, other colleagues' discussion presentations at a really wonderful event and learned a lot. So my focus uh, is like corporate actors, is private actors. So how corporations um, they could promote the protection of uh, biodiversity. Right. So I think this is where we are. Um, yeah, biodiversity risk, there's new ESG elephant in the room. And from such logic, we can see the risks are rising. So uh, how about the company's response to such a risk, to such a danger? So the company's governance biodiversity issue depends on the mandatory disclosure, the mandatory like transparency requirement. So uh, tentatively, we can see biodiversity crisis emphasize the need for corporate transparency. And we can see where we are and when we do with biodiversity issue and is the foundation on which human lives depend. And this is some like data, this is some like figures, we can see where the diversity, biodiversity is, and in terms of SDGs. Uh, unfortunately, there's a big decline in biodiversity at the moment, and it's a danger, it's a global challenge over policymakers, corporate actors, individuals, it's all the human beings. And it's a biodiversity loss, and it's through such an ecosystem fragmentation, is a key threat actually is one of the top, top five threats over the human being. And there's a dramatic rise in the loss of biodiversity. Um, so I believe I borrowed this one and just to share and the biodiversity is so important and to underpin the delivery of the SDG by 2030. So I, just as um, I think Hannah mentioned about the deforestation, or not, just like skip over a little bit, deforestation issue. And biodiversity loss and the, such a class is one of the top five threats over our human being. And why do we intervene? And from this figure, so you can see the, the dramatic drop and uh, over half, it's like 50% of global GDP depends on like high functioning of biodiversity issue. And unfortunately, there's only like 75% uh, of the largest company that do well with the disclosure. And you can see that the general trend and from like 1974 and to 2046. I just circle here where the biodiversity loss here. So you can see the interrelation at the intersection between each other. Um, I think it's like a vivid figure. You can see like a dramatic decline and uh, so here from index, so we can see the globally, this is a global landscape. So where from the thicker, you know, like you can see the biodiversity risk and danger globally. So 
And like uh, we have policymakers and we have corporate actors. So we have a different stakeholders, like from corporations. I think we are we need to be strongly aware of like such a danger. So for instance, by October 2021, so there's like a DB, uh, CBD convention in Kunming, China. They will try to make a target by 2030. So the target makes some sense. We needed to bend the curve of such laws. So there's inter, we can say that interaction between business and biodiversity directly and indirectly. There's a direct impact, indirect impact. Also, there's a cumulative impact. So from investor perspective, it's not the stakeholders. They should put pressure on companies to disclose, to address such a challenge, such a danger. So the corporate curious from the biodiversity laws, uh, you can see that they're quite comprehensive, like financial, economic, and investment. So corporations, they should seek new ways to tackle this system systemic risks. And we can see there are three approaches probably. They are also strongly interrelated, so-called impact, dependence, and the governance. So the biodiversity impact metric is a really important tool so to map the risk, to reshape, to address such issues. And I don't think we have like enough time to explain this. It's not something new. Uh, I think a few years ago, the Cambridge scholar they just raised such an issue, how to do with the natural capital and in relation to human capital and the produced capital, you can see this interrelationship. So I think from my area, I think reporting and make the reporting mandatory and from like a soft law to like we can say hard law, this is the right, we can say path to address the issue. So yesterday, I just tried to address this one. So how we could put the biodiversity into my research. So we come to the metric level, data level, tool level. To enhance the impact, I think we need to create a criteria and a guidance for not only like a disclosure of biodiversity risk danger, and also we need a guidance for decision making for like uh, policy makers. And uh, also very quickly, so you can see the adverse impact indicator for the corporate issuers. And uh, like ESG, especially like E, and we try to protect the biodiversity on the one hand, but on the other hand, as I mentioned, we are short of data. There's a big gap in ESG reporting, specifically for biodiversity. Only 32% of the largest companies, they are disclosing of biodiversity initiatives. They're threatening on the value in ESG. So, and this is my propose, proposal. And we needed to like from shareholder primacy and to the stakeholder theory oriented, then we try to enhance the more ESG, more SDG oriented model, which means the, the voluntary initiative not sufficient to do with the issue. So we do need to have a, like an ESG, biodiversity, mandatory due diligence. And uh, I think we just move on a little bit this UN Convention on Biodiversity. And uh, we have to transform such a biodiversity conversation into the engine of a group. Transparency, disclosure is a key. So um, like a GRI, I believe everybody knows here the 304 and with like strong relation to biodiversity. How cooperation depend on biodiversity? So how the cooperation can impact the biodiversity? So the, luckily, we have TNFD. So in the next couple of months, it could probably create the clearer picture so where we are getting at. So by 2050 division, so you can see the theory of change is complementary to a supportive 2030 agenda for SDGs. And uh, approaches with teeth. And globally, I believe just uh, Hannah mentioned about uh, Australia's approaches. So we can see the EU, the general trend is the voluntary initiative, not enough. We need to put the law. I believe the lawmakers, they are already on the way. The UK environment bill, I think the next year, we could have the breakthrough. The France Article 29. Um, so, 
And apart from policymakers, apart from the public actors, we can, you know, their threat, their pressure, or, you know, their, we can say, like laws. So how about other stakeholders? So for instance, investors, shareholders. So if the corporations that do not do well with biodiversity risk, they might be risk, like subject to rights of ESG litigation. So uh, ecosystem restoration and resilience. Uh, I think it's my last slide. Uh, sorry to rush because I can see the time. Uh, so we, we have to address the issue from on the one hand is macro level, on the other hand is macro level. So for the macro level, we try to secure a commitment to global tar target by 2050. So that the new global target, as I just mentioned, by October 2021 in Kunming. So that will make the clearer picture where the global like uh, issue, a uh, global like resolution to biodiversity. And uh, economic benefits of biodiversity globally, step by step, there should be a convergence of governance at a global level with policy, with the such standard. So from the macro level, we need to adjust, adjust strategies to address the risk about the like biodiversity issue. And the three integrations, integrate the ESG information into valuation model to have an impact assessment like a mechanism, try to integrate this main issue into investment and the financial decision making process. Last but not least, we have to integrate the biodiversity in committee's analysis. So I would like to conclude, and we should value the like such chain, value chain, and we have a strong due diligence strategy, and we should like transform from a voluntary initiative and to the legally binding initiative, such as EU approach, French approach, and UK approach. We should integrate biodiversity as a strategic initiative in the overall corporate strategy. Thank you very much. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. And what wonderful insights there. Um, I do some work on um, transition risk, but it's related to energy. So it was was so interesting to, to see this idea of biodiversity risk being addressed to ideas of corporate strategy and potentially corporate duties. Uh, fascinating work. Um, and again, uh, I can see so many uh, intertwining themes with Hannah's work and uh, the idea of um, are corporations liable for sorts of harm that uh, Rika was addressing? So I look forward to that dialogue that's coming out of these wonderful papers. So um, could I ask if there's anyone who has a um, clarifying question? There was one in the Q&A, but I think it's a more substantive one that was address, uh, addressed to Hannah. And I think that might be one that we carry over to the, dis to the broader discussion. But um, good. Uh, nothing in the chat at the moment. I might just give 30, you know, 30 seconds just to, to get to people to collect their thoughts. Uh, I've just got one in, looks like in the Q&A. Um, uh, this one is one for Rika, and a, again, it's a, I think it might be more substantive. And so Rika, would you um, perhaps look in the, the, the um, Q&A and perhaps um, give you some time to formulate uh, a response to that? But I think uh, it'll take you a little bit of time to talk about that. So we, we might move on um, at the moment. Okay, so... Um, Thank you. Um, we're moving very rapidly. All our speakers have been wonderful in keeping to time and the insights um, delivered in, in a very succinct and um, compelling manner. So I'd now like to move to our next speaker, Professor Jose Maria Zanowski. And uh, if are you um, sharing screen, uh, please, Jose Maria? Sorry, and you may still be on mute. Uh, can you hear me? We can now, thank you. Yes, thanks very much. 
Okay. Well, this is good morning in Brazil. And uh, the sun just rose a few two minutes ago. Uh, this is good evening for you. Uh, I'm I'm talking to you from the northeast uh, region of Brazil, just by the Atlantic. I'm in a remote area, so I hope the connection works. I'm just uh, outside one uh, important indigenous reserve here from the Tremembe tribe. So I'm I'm very happy to participate in this global dialogue in representing Brazil. Um, I'm I'm currently working on this paper about uh, the Brazilian national policy on payments for environmental services. We just came in in January 21. Some countries already have uh, a lot of experience about this. Uh, Costa Rica is the, um, is the most well-known experience, but for Brazil it is new. And um, the, the scale of Brazil makes it very important. And, and now there's a lot of expectation on the ruling of Article 6 of the Paris Agreement that will bring more international cooperation uh, in, in conservation and preservation efforts. So the, 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 the topic is quite uh, hot at the moment. So I hope to bring some insights uh, for you on this issue. So um, as, as some of you may know, Brazil is the most biological diverse country in the world. And according to the UN, it is estimated that it retains from 15 to 20 percent of the world's biological diversity. It has the largest land protected area in the world. Uh, this chart will show you that the more than 61 percent of Brazilian territory is covered with forests still, and more than 66 percent of native vegetation. That is despite or having lost around 87 million hectares between 1985 to 2090, mostly to agriculture with 39 million and pasture with uh, 43 million. But it's still more than half of the territory is still legally protected. Uh, there is certainly a great wealth in terms of nature and biodiversity but that is not reflected in the development of these people. You can see here uh, that Brazil is currently number 84 in the human development ranking with an HDI, which is quite low for 0 0.765 in 2020. If you take it for the Amazon state, for instance, where the Amazon forest is, the index is even lower, is 0 0.674, making it a, a place 18 among uh, the Brazilian uh, 27 states. So why this is happening? Uh, well, as pointed out, was one of the creators of the Human Development Index, the Indian economist Amartya Sen, one of the reasons for this is that currently the GNP only captures the elements that are transacted in the market, leaves out many benefits and costs that do not have price tags attached to them. Among these are many environmental assets and natural resources that are excluded from the measurement of wealth. These are still considered non-marketable goods that remain outside the market. This is also explained why generally there is a lack of incentive for the conservation of natural resources in the existing economic system, provided there is no direct valuation of these goods. There's a market play failure that leaves out of the economic equation not only the negative but also positive externalities of social and environmental dimensions. So uh, in Brazil, there are many real consequences of business as usual under the current system. In cities, as you can see in these pictures, uh, areas that should be preserved are abandoned by landowners, provided there is no economic utility. Uh, currently, these areas are occupied by poor populations, as you can see in this picture. In the countryside, it causes land use change and, of course, deforestation. And here are some numbers already mentioned uh, here during this presentation uh, from, according to Global Forest Watch, uh, from 2001 to 2020, Brazil lost almost 60 million hectares of tree cover, representing uh, 32.5 gigatons of CO2 emissions. 
Actually, Brazil has a very uh, renewable energy source. Almost 80% of the energy in Brazil is renewable because of the hydroelectric power. But uh, uh, so the, the major problem with emissions in Brazil is land use change, as you will see. This is taken from the third uh, national communication of Brazil to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. It shows that land use and land use change in forestry is responsible for almost half of net CO2 emissions by sector in Brazil. Energy industrial sectors, on the other hand, represent only a minor part of the emissions. Um, some environmental programs implemented as of 2006 were able to cut emissions in that sector, namely with REED programs, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation framework, partly funded by governments of Germany, Norway, and UK to the Amazon Fund. However, uh, you can see in the graphic here that the, 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 the green, uh, the green uh, part will go down as of this uh, 2006. However, emissions have started to raise again in the last few years. Well, these are some, uh, already, Hannah already mentioned about this. Uh, Brazil has been highly criticized uh, for the, actually, especially the Brazilian government for the current uh, deforestation rates and the fires in the Amazon. You can see here, world leaders and celebrities have mentioned this, uh, this fact. Uh, but we like to, to uh, differentiate here illegal uh, deforestation from legal for, uh, deforestation because that will require different approaches as we'll see. Um, in fact, in rural areas in Brazil, there's a legal requirement for landowners to keep at least 20% of forests as legal results for conservation purposes without any indemnification. Uh, if you go to the Brazilian Amazon, this requirement goes up to 80% of every property. The remaining parts of the land can be used provided there is an environmental licensing procedure. And besides, all conservation and preservation areas must be kept untouched, such as spring and perennial water sources and margins, slopes and hilltops, sand banks, dunes, mangroves, and so on. Illegal deforestation is tackled with regulation and enforced by conventional command and control policies and measures. So you can picture the difficulty uh, how it is to to supervise a, an area with more than 5 million square kilometers of forest with very limited access. Uh, it is also very cost costly, especially to developing countries with many other social pressing needs, such as health, education, social security, et cetera. Over the last few decades, there has been a great technological improvement in satellite monitoring with systems like deter, deforestation detected in real time, and produce measurement of deforestation by remote sensors, both ran by the National Institute of Spatial Research. Moreover, the Institute has launched this year the Amazonia One, the first Earth observation satellite completely designed, integrated, and tested and operated by Brazil. Amazonia One will provide images for environmental agricultural monitoring throughout the Brazilian territory. All of that, however, is still not enough to completely detain forestation. Stopping legal deforestation, on the other hand, needs to be dealt with economic incentives designed to prevent it while driving activities for the attainment of environmental goals. Among these, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and the protection of biodiversity. This brings us to the new Brazilian national policy on payment of environmental services, federal law 14,119 of January 2021. One of the objectives is to set forth market-based um, instruments to incentivize the conservation of ecosystems and to integrate values of nature and its services into the economic chain. Mechanism for the payment of ecosystem services is a trendy topic right now. It offers new approach to current policies such as environmental taxation and carbon pricing. It diverges from the conventional polluter pay principle by emphasizing the positive side of its environmental externalities foreseeing compensation for its agents, including indigenous and traditional communities. The provision of ecosystem services, services is set forth by contract as a valid and efficient means to allocate property rights in a cohesion manner. Contracts such as these are instrumental to sponsor nature-based solutions like carbon sequestration, climate regulation, erosion control, pollinizing, and fertilization, to name a few. 
It also motivates anthropogenic environmental services like recycling, reuse, reverse logistics, waste management, sanitation, environmental studies, and others that strengthen the first. Demand for environmental offset projects is expected to rise exponentially in the near future, especially with carbon reduction goals under the UNFCCC, especially with Green New Deal. The raising awareness of climate emergency is to enhance international cooperation on that field, including the private sector. ESG, for instance, has been also a trending topic in many sectors, especially on finance. Brazilian nature and biodiversity have many nature-based solutions to offer to the world that can help countries to achieve environmental goals, especially with regards to fight against climate change. According to a paper published by In Nature, by Tiradin and all, et al., um, nature-based solutions could reduce the global peak temperature and suppress warming beyond uh, 2100, if they are uh, ambitious and designed for longevity. According to their estimation, it would save 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year between avoided emissions and enhancing with protection management and restoration of land. Some researchers say that tree restoration is the most effective climate change solution we have available and restoration of forest cover is widely considered most viable new term opportunity for carbon removal. I hope I'm okay with the time. Oh, I but think I'm maybe, to... sorry, just uh, if you could wrap up in the next minute or so, that'd be great. Thank you. And time to add in questions. Thanks. Okay. Um, this is some, uh, I, I recommend you to read this, uh, this um, white paper from Microsoft that it has a project to not only neutralize, but also to make a carbon negative. And they, they show some recent experiences with the project. And they say that the, the, the carbon market is still very immature, basically. That, that's the point of the paper. And um, as I mentioned before, uh, there's much expectation on the COP26 that will be held in November in uh, Glasgow that uh, there's still a lack of regulation on Article 6 of Paris Agreement that will provide for international cooperation in this field with uh, Article 6.2 says for key with internationally transferred mitigation outcomes between countries to comply with their NDCs and 6.4, which is a mission mitigating mechanism, uh, sort of like the, the, the clean mechanism that we have at uh, the Kyoto, Pro, Kyoto Protocol, but adapted to the Paris Agreement. And in 6.8, some non-market approaches. Some estimations show that this could generate a trade in, in 58 to 167 billion in total. And then Brazil's share would be around 19 to 27 billion, according to these studies. So this is a very inter interesting market for Brazil to, to finance the forest conservation. Well, I, I will run it out of time, so I, I will skip this. Um, I was just... Uh, point out that Brazil has um, some competitive advantages in low carbon activities like forest conservation, renewable energies and energy efficient, and that linkage could reduce marginal compliance costs um, to the ones, to the different uh, stakeholders. If you can have an, a better estimation, it is estimated that the, price, the carbon pricing in Brazil that doesn't have an ETS yet, but it's preparing to do so, will be $10 against uh, 50 euros from the EU zone. Okay, okay, so this is a bit information about the NDC. So in conclusion, um, the, new, the new Brazilian national policy of payment or environmental services sets forth a domestic framework to incentivize the conservation of ecosystems and to integrate values of nature and service to the economic chain. A possible agreement on the rules governing the mechanisms set for under Article 6 of the Paris Agreement on COP26 will open many new opportunities for international cooperation in the fight against climate change. The Brazil has some competitive advantages regarding nature-based solutions that can be developed globally 
and the linkage between Brazilian national policy and payments for environmental services and green deals show like higher ambition and additionality while also being competitive and effective for the economic perspective. Thank you. I'm sorry if I passed the time. This is my email if you want to get in touch. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you very much. And look, um, the extent to which uh, we're sort of uh, having to compress what are very, very complex issues in um, a very short time frame. And I appreciate how difficult it is to work through uh, the Paris Agreement, Green Climate Fund issues, apply it to uh, Brazil, and then think about the, the new national policy all in a very short space of time. So you've done an amazing job. And some of these ideas about carbon pricing and linkages and so on, I'm sure um, we can pick up in the dialogue after we've, we've had um, all the presentations because there's so many, I, I can see a strong forest and different approaches, market-based um, versus sort of um, <clears throat> thinking about criminal penalties for illegal trade uh, coming through uh, here with all these papers. But in fairness to our very patient last speaker, um, could I ask, are there any uh, quick questions for clarification? Perhaps um, if people do have uh, queries around that last section of the pricing and those other carbon market issues, perhaps you could pop them in the chat for Jose Maria. I can't see uh, any there at the moment, but I think perhaps now we might move to Julieta's presentation. Uh, Julieta, are you um, sharing screen? Yes, I am. Thank you, Professor Okay, Gordon. thank you very much. I'll uh, hand over to you now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, for this opportunity. I'm very happy to be here. Um, my presentation will analyze fragmentation and a possible outlook looking ahead at transformative change and living in harmony with nature in 2050. And this is part of my doctoral uh, research that I'm doing at the University of Faifana in Duneburg. Um, so I will be giving a brief context. I'm very brief because these topics have been touched all uh, through the three days of intensive global dialogue. And then I will be um, addressing um, the, the issue leading to a transformative change for biodiversity of which options do we have at the moment with the current uh, negotiations um, for COP15, then a possible outlook and leading to final conclusions. Um, so